My name is Pastor Mark Heinrich, and I am speaking to you from my woodshed here in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. I'm the pastor of Sutton Free Will Baptist Church from Sutton, Vermont. I live here in Barton, nearby, near Sutton, and it's my pleasure to speak to you today uh, and to share with you some wonderful things from the Bible about Jesus. And I think that this is particularly important at this time for us to talk about the things that matter and the things that endure and the things that really count. And so it's worthwhile for us to study these things in the Bible, worthwhile for us to really focus in. And so in a couple of minutes I will be taking you into John chapter 11, the Gospel of John chapter 11. And the story is about the raising of Lazarus. But before I do that, I want to talk to you about some things about where we are today. And uh, it is April 3rd, uh, 2020, and about 3 o'clock, 2.30 in the afternoon. And um, we are in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. And there are people uh, that are in here in Vermont that are sick and are suffering, there have been some deaths. There's a lot of concern amongst the population and a lot of worry and a lot of care and some folks have experienced significant catastrophic loss. And my heart goes out to you if you're in that place right now. If you're fearful, not concerned about where things are going to go and uh, but all the more reason for us to really focus in on the things that matter. And I want to say a word of assurance to everybody, and including myself, that no matter what's going on today, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that God in His grace and His goodness is always kind and always just and always loving. And if we approach Him and ask for His mercy, He will give it to us generously. And that's the, really the heart of the message today. And one of the things that I find when I work with folks, I've been in a pastoral ministry for a long time, almost 30 years, and I have uh, worked with folks, I've been a hospital chaplain, I've done lots of different types of ministry, uh, that uh, fear is a big factor in a lot of people's lives. And especially fear of death. And uh, having worked with a lot of folks, and uh, been involved in assisting hospice ministry and been involved in uh, working with folks who have s experienced signi significant catastrophic loss. Um, I want to say a word of assurance to you right now that God does love you and cares and God is still in control. So some thoughts about this. <clears throat> uh, that um, one of the factors that people fear about death is the unknown. Uh, the pain and the suffering, certainly, of death uh, for the individual who dies, plus the family. And, um, and so the fear of the unknown is a, is a huge factor. And so I have to excuse that I've got cars going by my nice wonderful woodshed here, but it's nice to be outside and, and nice to talk to. Uh, this way instead of being in the house. Anyways, um, as people face the issue of their own mortality, um, uh, that uh, it, it brings up uh, worries and cares and concerns. And, uh, and so all the more reason for us to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All the more reason to be uh, sure of our relationship with God who is eternal and uh, that he reaches out to us and cares about us and beckons us and calls us into relationship into a loving saving relationship with him and that that relationship that God establishes with us that saving relationship is bigger than death it's bigger than life. It's bigger than everything because it's God who has made it. So one of the great things that we can do now is to have a sense of perspective 
about where things are and who God is. And is God greater than this pandemic? Absolutely, no question. And so uh, as we look at John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus, uh, let's, let's really focus in and see what happens. Jesus says in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he die, yet will he live. And he means all humankind. He and she. All of us. And isn't that a beautiful, broad, wonderful statement? And it's on the based on the credibility of Jesus Christ. It's not my credibility or somebody else's credibility. This is based on the credibility of Jesus. He said this. And I trust him in that and I know you can too and so for this time and this very difficult situation that we find ourselves in uh, realize that Jesus Christ is bigger than coronavirus Jesus Christ is bigger than all of the worries and the tensions and the concerns that we have and that we can trust in him and he will do right by us now uh, let us focus in on John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus, and to take a very good close look and see that Jesus is bigger than life and he's bigger than death. Amen. I'm going to work with you through John chapter 11. Lazarus come forth but first of all because I've had requests from people who have viewed my earlier videos I'm going to bring Strider into the picture so let me have Strider and so Strider also wants to say hi and that he loves these videos and he is just really thrilled about this whole thing so anyways in my earlier two videos, I looked very closely at John chapter 9 and then John chapter 10. You, perhaps you recall that in John chapter 9 that um, we saw that Jesus is the light of the world. And while we think about that, I think it's worthwhile for us to talk about uh, the Bible itself for a moment and to explain my approach to it. I am qualified to preach on this. I do have a Master of Divinity. I have studied the Gospel of John uh, in great depth uh, for one of my seminary classes that the entire year we were focused on the Gospel of John. We did translation, uh, we did memorization, we took uh, exams and quizzes uh, a lot. And uh, so I not only did I pass that class uh, with an A, I believe, but I also passed a Greek language, New Testament Greek language uh, competency exam and took an entire summer's course on translating from the New Testament Greek into English. Now you'll see that by and large I use the New International Version and then I also go and paraphrase from that. So again, uh, the Bible, why is it so important? It's the Word of God and it tells us about Jesus. And it's God's Word to us about Jesus and about His plan for our life. And so. Uh, again, as I said in John chapter 9, with the healing of the blind man, the man born blind, we saw that Jesus uh, is the light of the world. In John chapter 10, we saw that uh, we also see that Jesus is the good shepherd and that he lays down his life for his sheep. Now in John chapter 11, we have the story of the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus uh, and his sisters, Mary and Martha, were friends of Jesus. And uh, that, uh, in fact, Martha says to Jesus in the middle of this story, Lord, the one that you love has died, Lazarus, your friend, 
the one that you love has died. And just to be very clear about that word love, uh, it is based on the Greek word philia, which is clearly translated brotherly love. And so it's certainly true that in this setting that Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, are great friends of Jesus. And uh, that when Jesus stays in Jerusalem, some of the time he stays at their house. Uh, they lived in Bethany, which is just very close to Jerusalem. And so the, uh, that Jesus stayed with them a lot. Uh, there is, of course, the very wonderful story of Mary and Martha when Jesus was teaching. Uh, Martha came to him, Jesus, and complained about Mary not helping because she was listening to Jesus. And of course, that, that's, uh, we're familiar with that story. But back to uh, John chapter 11 with the raising of Lazarus. So the chapter begins a, a narrative flow that is very consistent for about 45 verses. And the first verse in chapter 11 talks about, now there was a man named Lazarus who was sick. And in the first couple of paragraphs, it, talks, it says that he was sick and he was very sick. And so clearly um, uh, that Jesus had received notification from the sisters that uh, his friend Lazarus had, was uh, sick and that this was a, uh, uh, a very great sickness. He was very ill. And of course, the implication in their messaging to Jesus was, you know, please come and, uh, and help him, uh, you know, pray for him, please, Lord. But interestingly, very quickly in the first couple of verses, uh, we see that uh, Jesus hesitates and even uh, is seemingly reluctant to come and, uh, and do the thing that is asked of these people who uh, by these, he's asked by these people who are great friends of his. And that uh, he's like, um, well, he, he's, he's going to be okay, is what Jesus says, basically, in a paraphrase. He says, um, the sickness is not unto death. And so, um, finally, we find out that it is a catastrophic illness, that Lazarus has died, and that there is a... Um, there is great sadness because Lazarus has died. So uh, the, the beauty of this moment is that uh, there is this tension where uh, Jesus is capable, we are told in the Gospels, of healing Lazarus. And uh, so will he? And will he... Uh, come and say the prayers for Lazarus that will certainly raise him up. And so um, the, uh, uh, the tension is heightened, in fact, by the fact that uh, Jesus is beginning to meet very stiff opposition in Jerusalem and, and, and in a sense has made a strategic move away from Jerusalem just very, very just prior to the story of John 11 and that uh, the Pharisees and the religious rulers in Jerusalem are fuming. They are so angry with Jesus. And in one particular case, they even say that uh, he is uh, blaspheming and he's claiming to be God and uh, that this is uh, absolutely completely unacceptable. And it even says that they begin plotting his demise. And so back to Jesus and Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Uh, so Jesus, as I said, hesitates when the first request or first notification, shall we say, comes to him about Lazarus. And he stays, in fact, even two days longer. And uh, basically the, the sisters get a message to Jesus, you know, please come and save him, basically is what they're saying. And that uh, he is capable of healing Lazarus, but seems to be unwilling or something of that nature. He hesitates, saying this sickness will not end in death, but this is for the glory of God. It's really hard to imagine 
how sickness could be for the glory of God. So this story begins with some, some real tension here. Is Jesus going to go ahead and heal Lazarus? Uh, what are the Pharisees doing against Jesus? And uh, what is going to happen with this thing? Because Lazarus, Jesus has just, in a sense, fled Jerusalem uh, to save his own life in a strategic move. It was not yet quite yet time for him to go to the cross. Uh, and so now basically uh, Mary and Martha are saying, come back to Jerusalem. And, uh, uh, but this is not something, the, Jesus does not hesitate because he's afraid for his life. He hesitates because he knows what's going to happen. So again, this sickness is not unto death. And so, you know, the disciples are, so the, this request comes to Jesus, come and, and heal Lazarus. And the disciples are like, you're great. Don't go back there. You're crazy. This is terrible. They're going to kill you. We were just there. They're, they're about ready to stone you. Don't go there. And, uh, and so Jesus says something wonderful uh, that's very telling here. What he says is, during the day, people can walk safely. At night, you might stumble because there's no light. And basically, he's saying, I'm with you now. So, you know, again, he has, he has hesitated. Now he's saying, let's go. He's saying, I'm with you now. Let's go do this thing. Okay. And so Jesus has now shifted away from hesitating to actually journeying back to the Jerusalem area, back to Bethany, back to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So Martha comes out and meets him. And she says, Lord, if only you had been here, Lazarus would have been fine. And, but he's dead. He has died. And Jesus is like, do you believe in me? And Jesus says, your brother will rise again. His sickness will not end in death. He says, he will rise again. And so Jesus with Martha. Now, of course, think about Martha's frame of mind at this time. Martha is weeping. She is grieving. She has just lost her dear brother. And she's very sad. And, uh, and she loves Jesus and loves him and loves him and loves him. And she goes to him. He is the source of healing and of, of so much. And they, they are beginning to really understand who he is. And, and so uh, the beauty of this moment is that Martha comes to him in her great need. And her first thing is that she kind of complains. It's like, Lord, why weren't you there? And, you know, that touches a question that people often have when encountering suffering and difficulty and challenges. It's like, Lord, where were you? And there's even a type of theology, a, a, a study in theology called theodicy. That's T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y theodicy. And that's how can a good God allow human suffering like this? And so the answer to that, of course, is that uh, we live in a world where God, that God has created where human beings operate in a state of free will. God has not simply programmed us like robots and determined, predetermined everything that we do, everything we say, our behaviors, actions, beliefs, that sort of thing. That is not the case. We operate in a state of free will where we can choose well or we can choose badly. And so in a sense, God has reserved himself and stepped back a little bit from this world. Doesn't mean he doesn't operate in this world. He certainly does. But we are in a world where there is free will, where we can choose God's way or we can walk away from God. That really, truly is a choice that we have. And so uh, you, you have this moment where, uh, where Lazarus has died. Martha is grieving. Mary hasn't even shown up. She's at home. She's, she is grieving herself. God bless her. 
and that uh, there, Jesus has not yet returned all the way to Lazarus's tomb, but he's getting there. And there is an, a heightened st a state of tension and of, if I may use the word drama here, because Jesus is coming, the Pharisees hear about it, and they show up. And so there is this meeting at the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus now has been in the tomb for four days. Jesus shows up there. Martha is, is with him. Mary shows up asking the same question, Lord, if you had been here, he would not have died. And so uh, there is this heightened state of tension. And if you know you or I were uh, in the crowd watching this whole thing, we would be looking at the Pharisees and they're still fuming probably and really angry and everything. And there's Mary and Martha who are very, very sad. And there, here it is in this uh, place of burial in uh, near Jerusalem where Lazarus' body has been laid. And so there is this heightened state of tension and drama and what's he going to do? What's he going to do? What's Jesus going to do? And so Jesus asked, where have you laid him? Where, where, is his, where is his tomb? And so they go there. And there is such a mixture of emotions. You can just think about the scene right here, right now. They show him where the tomb is. Nothing's happened yet. There's fuming Pharisees. There's grieving Mary and Martha and other folks who are legitimately grieving, very sad, very overcome with grief. But there's also a crowd there that, uh, you know, people would come and gather whenever Jesus would show up. It was kind of like a circus, they thought. And, ooh, let's see what he'll do this time. And it's not like they were there because of their faith or anything, but just sort of show me a, a, a miracle, show me, you know, fireworks, whatever. And so, uh, so here's this moment just before Jesus does anything, and there's all these different things going on in the crowd. And Jesus, it says in the scripture, this is really fascinating, that he is inwardly groaning. That's what the scripture actually says. At this point, he's inwardly groaning and he gets angry. And of course, this is the part of the Gospel of John chapter 11, where you get that shortest sentence in the Bible, Jesus wept. And he actually, the literal translation, shed tears. But it isn't just, oh gosh, I'm so very sad. This is a very sad moment and I'm grieving along with everybody else and, and everything. He is all, he is very sad that this is the state of humankind where in effect at this point up to this moment that death has had its way and that uh, that people have uh, are here to watch fireworks and a miracle and some kind of a display and that uh, he's got the Pharisees that are fuming and, and angry with him and that this is not creation as God originally wanted it and that it just is so far so distant from what God originally desired, but that's okay. Jesus showed up and he's there, but he's inwardly groaning and he's, he is, uh, he's so angry, he's shedding tears. And that's really specifically what the Bible says. And it says it twice, in fact. And so it's, this is the moment just before he does anything where we stop and we look and we kind of capture the scene in our minds with the Pharisees and the crowd and the uh, Mary and Martha and their true grief, their honest true grief about their brother. And, and then over here, there's the people that are seeking a spectacle. And over there, there's the professional paid mourners. And, and uh, it's a circus. Oh, my goodness. And then so... Jesus says, roll away the stone. Roll away the stone, he says. And then it says in a loud voice, he shouts, Lazarus, come forth. Doesn't say it twice, doesn't say it three times. Says it once. And then very quickly, the figure emerges from the tomb. It's Lazarus who has been dead, who has been risen by the power of God, still wrapped in his 
clo cloths uh, uh, that had been put on him for burial. He comes forth out of the grave and can you, so here we are still in that scene. We've got the professional mourners. We've got Mary and Martha. We've got the furious Pharisees. We've got the spectacle seekers. We've got all these people. And just, can you hear the gasp from the crowd when he comes forth, out of, Lazarus comes forth out of the grave? Can you hear the shock and the surprise? And the Pharisees are spitting nails. They are so angry right now and they're, overawed by what has happened and it is incredible and so uh, Jesus then goes further and he says unbind him take off those burial cloths now the moment carries on from there guess what this is not a typical funeral okay and uh, that this is something where the person who had died and was there for days, and uh, I believe it's Martha had said, well, Lord, really should we uh, open the, the grave because there will be a certain odor. And she was just being practical, trying to think of, of what, uh, what the situation was. And, uh, and, and so uh, now, bam, Lazarus walks out of the grave and something happens here that has never ever happened before that this man who had been dead four days has been risen from the dead he is alive and so jesus has said to mary and martha i am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will not die and so that's the key thing i don't know if you've, uh, if you have ever been to a funeral uh, that is done in a christian uh, standpoint from a Christian standpoint that this is the scripture often that the uh, the pastor or the officiant at the funeral will read as a message of comfort uh, to the grieving families uh, Jesus is the resurrection and the life and that in our belief we will truly live and we will truly enter into the life that God has prepared for us and so that's a that's that's an incredible moment now let's pause for a moment and again this is un, in the under the heading of lent and various aspects and thinking a forward in lent to holy week which is going to start i'm doing this on april 2nd uh holy week begins next sunday with palm sunday and then of course we have uh Maundy thursday good friday and then Easter Sunday is on the 12th of April. And so we're foreshadowing the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And that while uh, culturally uh, the world thinks that death is, uh, is just something that you have to deal with, it's just something that happens. And uh, I, uh, in particular, have as a hospital chaplain for 10 years have uh, have worked with families who have experienced significant loss catastrophic loss dozens of times done dozens of funerals and uh that uh, that the world considers death to be uh immutable and 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 something that just is is uh the same for everybody but in fact jesus is showing us in here in the gospel of john that he is lord not only over the earth and of uh, everything in it, but also he is Lord over death and that he has power and authority over death. Now, do people die? Of course, I mean, I'm not arguing that at all, but that Jesus is Lord of everything and that he as God the Son has authority and jurisdiction over death. And that when we come to him and we believe in him, we are uh, believing in and aligning ourselves with somebody who is more powerful than even death itself. And so it's wonderful for us to meditate on the power of Jesus Christ, who is eternal and who is all powerful and that he is Lord even over death. And that is just a tremendous comfort. Now, uh, one of the uh, challenges uh, and God bless the folks who uh, right now are suffering loss, catastrophic loss of a family member who or who may be ill themselves from this coronavirus thing, 
coronavirus 19, I guess they call it. Uh, God bless the people who are struggling with this, and my prayers go out to you, uh, and, and that, uh, that trusting in Jesus at this time is more important than ever for all of us, myself included. And so trust in Jesus. Now, uh, can I predict what will be the uh, outcome of every particular situation? Uh, no, obviously. But what I can tell you is that no matter what happens, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. And that Jesus is more powerful than death. And Jesus is greater than death. And in fact, Jesus has authority over death. And he demonstrates that here in John chapter 11. And so we also have to think about from a biblical standpoint how death has really two aspects to it. One is the, the cessation of the biological cessation of physical life. That's one aspect of it. But the other part of it is spiritual death, which the Bible uh, works with that theme uh, very consistently throughout uh, from Genesis to Revelation. And it's very clear that uh, there is a spiritual death that can happen to uh, a person that is something that we want to avoid. Uh, and we usually term it going to hell uh, that kind of thing. And, but there, the Bible does speak coherently about death and, and uh, that there is a first death, which is the uh, biological cessation of life. There's also a second death where uh, the, those who are evildoers, those who have done horrible things and not repented, those who uh, uh, have existed for themselves and nobody else, those who have not uh, embraced a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, that there is a second death and it's a horrible outcome. And right now I implore you, I beg you to consider and to embrace a saving relationship of Jesus, with Jesus Christ, because that is the second life. That is the entrance into eternal life. And uh, so God bless you. If you're considering this right now, I pray that in the name of Jesus, that you consider Jesus as your savior, that you embrace him as Lord and that you repent of your sins and that you begin your new walk as, as a Christian. So we are, let's move ahead with this, with this, uh, with this idea here, this moment that we have, back to Lazarus, back to Jesus, back to uh, this moment. Je uh, Lazarus has been uh, has risen from the dead at the command of Jesus. Uh, that uh, the, they have unbound him, and then the story moves on from there, where clearly the Pharisees can do no other thing but plan on Jesus' demise. And this is just prior to uh, uh, the uh, Good Friday uh, in the narrative of the Gospel of John and all, the, uh, all of the four Gospels that uh, this place, the raising of Lazarus, is just before Jesus goes to the cross. This is a time when the Pharisees figure out uh, there's nothing else they can do. They've got to kill Jesus. Otherwise, they are lost. And whether it's because they have a, uh, a peace co peaceful coexistence with the Romans at this point, and Jesus is going to muck, they feel Jesus is going to muck that all up, or because they're afraid of losing their power and their influence over the people of Israel, uh, or a bunch of things like that. Uh, that the Pharisees decide that, that there's nothing else to do but to seize him and throw him to the Romans and, uh, and have them kill him. And so that's the point that we're at, that the, the, uh, the drama, the story, the narrative about Jesus and his ministry, uh, all of the different points of it that have come before this, uh, that now the Pharisees know uh, that or they decide in their own hearts that they've got to kill Jesus to put an end to all this. And so the, the beauty of that is that, that God knew that this was going to happen. And th it's not that God chose it, but that he knew that people would make these kinds of choices. 
and that uh, there was a way to bring this whole thing about such that ultimately, and I'm quoting from Joseph in the book of Genesis, right at towards the end, who said, you intended this for harm, and we could think of, of God saying this to the Pharisees, you intended this for harm, but I have turned this for good. And this is the way often Jesus works. This is the way often the Father works, in that he takes all things and shapes them and styles them and adjusts them with a beautiful light touch to make it all work together for the good of those who love Jesus. And so uh, how do we know this? We know this because in our experience as Christians of being born again, in our experience as Christians who have embraced the salvation that Jesus offers, that that brings a new heart and a new mind to us and that we can begin to understand the ways of God, that beautiful, wonderful way of God, the gentleness and the love, even in the fierce resistance and the violence and the darkness of this world, that God is still light and is still life, and that God loves us, God loves you, and God loves me, and that that never, ever changes. And so that's something for us to remember in this very difficult time right now and have true hope in, that is, that God loves us. And so um, we have the opportunity to be in relationship with God. We have the opportunity to be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit as Christians. We have the opportunity to pray to God and get answers. Uh, to our prayers. We can pray for our neighbors. We can pray for people across the country. We can pray for people in different countries. And that our relationship with God gives us ac access to be able to do that. And so I strongly urge folks to continue to pray for your friends and your neighbors and your family. Pray for yourself, pray for God's protection. There's nothing wrong with that. Of course, God knows that we're gonna pray for ourselves. And he does not reject us and he does not, uh, does not put us aside because we pray for ourselves. However, we do need to pray for others. And so pray for those who are in the hospital right now. Pray for the families who are worried about their loved ones. Pray for those who are uncertain and fearful and, uh, and struggling right now because of the situation in this world. There are people out there, they're perfectly healthy, uh, but they've been laid off and the unemployment may be not enough to meet all their bills and they're wondering and they're worried about being able to pay their rent or their mortgage. And so uh, there's lots of opportunity for us as Christians to pray and to pray and to pray. And so my, my conclusion here is that because our faith in Jesus Christ is based on the Bible, based on Jesus of the Bible, based on Jesus that we know who lives and reigns forever, for instance, that this is Jesus who is the resurrection and the life. He is the light of the world. He's the good shepherd. All of these things the Gospel of John has been telling us, that we know he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. And he is the Lord, and he loves each and every one of us. And he desires relationship, and he wants to hear us to pray to him and talk to him. And he has peace and comfort and consolation for each and every one of us. He has direction, he has guidance, and there's just, he has mercy. And so praise God for all of those wonderful, wonderful things. And so my charge to you today and to myself is to trust in the mercy and the love of God. Trust in his goodness. Trust that he is Lord over everything and that he is doing marvelous, wonderful things right now, even now, for you and for me. And some of it we see and some of it we don't see. But the word is, trust in Jesus and he will never let you down.